Word of God tells us, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. For this I say, that each of you says... I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Verses that are very familiar to us but a foundational text for what we want to study about tonight. I want to encourage you to get your Bibles out and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to spend tonight part in these four verses that we've just quoted from that text tonight to help us to come to a greater appreciation for what the Bible teaches us. Tonight I want us to talk about the church of Christ. I know for some, immediately when you hear that, when you see those words go on the screen, I know there's certain things that may come to mind. You may think, well, I, I, I went to a church of Christ once. Or you may think, well, you know, I, I've had family that have gone to the church of Christ. Or, you know, that there's a church of Christ on this side of town and there's a church of Christ on that side of town. Let me tell you what I mean by the church of Christ when I'm using it in this entire lesson tonight. Not just in this sentence but for the entirety of this lesson tonight. I'm not talking about the church of Christ on this side of town or the church of Christ on that side of town. I'm not talking about the church of Christ that you drove by all of those years when you used to live somewhere else. The church of Christ that I want us to talk about tonight is the church that we read about in the Bible. That's the only one I'm concerned about tonight. Your minds may go somewhere else when we talk about the church of Christ tonight. My mind is going to be parked in what we read in the pages of the Bible, and that's where I want your mind to be tonight. So whenever we use that expression, the church of Christ tonight, which one are we talking about? We're talking about the one in the Bible. And when we talk about the church of Christ that is in the Bible... What we learn when we read from the Bible from cover to cover, not just limited to the New Testament, when you read the Bible from cover to cover, what you learn about the church of Christ, the one that we read about in the Bible, you learn that the church of Christ is not a denomination. Now that title has been announced tonight. We mentioned that title yesterday. When you hear that title... Some folks may hear that title and say, oh, boy, that's awfully, that's a controversial subject. Some people may hear that title and they may think, boy, that's, that's, that's rather narrow minded of you. Or or, or they, they may, there's some folks who may see that title and maybe you're one of these that just, I'm just kind of uneasy. I'm a little uncomfortable using terminology like that. What I want to do tonight is to take our thoughts, if we can, to take our feelings, if we can, to take our opinions, to take our emotions, if we can. And let's just set them aside tonight. And let's pick up our Bibles. And let's just see what the Bible teaches us about this subject. What does the Bible teach us about the church of Christ? What does the Bible teach us about denominations? And everything we're going to see tonight are in these four verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. The lesson tonight only has two points to it. The church of Christ is not a denomination. Number one, we're going to see because of what we know about denominationalism from these four verses. 
And the second point will be the Church of Christ is not a denomination because of what we know from these verses about Christ's church. Have I given you enough time to get your Bibles open? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 through 13. Let's study this together. And let's see if we can just simply allow the Bible to do the teaching tonight. Please, please, don't let the preacher get in the way of the book. Don't let me get in the way. I'm going to do my very best to hide myself behind and inside of this book. Sometimes preachers get fired up. You ever seen a preacher get fired up? Sometimes a preacher gets going. I'm going to try to keep me out of the way. I'm going to try to keep my passions, if I can, out of the way. And I simply want us to get into the book and let it do the teaching tonight. The Church of Christ, which one are we talking about? The one we read about in the Bible. The Church of Christ that we read about in the Bible is not a denomination because of what we know about denominationalism. I'm not asking you what you know about denominationalism from your observations. What do we know about denominationalism just from these verses? What we learn about denominationalism from these three verses are going to be three things that we're going to see. And the word denomination, the word denominationalism starts with the letter D, so I'm going to try to key in with that letter D and think about three things that we learn about denominationalism from this text. First thing I want us to see is that denominationalism, just from this text we read, is something that is devised of the human mind and not of the divine. You say, how do you get that out of these verses? You're going to ask that a lot tonight. How do you get that out of these verses? How do you see in these verses that denominationalism is devised from the human mind? Look in verse 11. Paul says in verse 11, For it's been declared to me concerning who? It's been declared to me concerning you. My brethren, that there are contentions among you. Now look in verse 12. Now this I say, that each of you is saying. Where was all of this coming about? Was this something that God had in mind? Each of you is saying this. Similar to what Paul would say to the Galatian church in Galatians chapter Galatians chapter 1, that he, I marvel that you are so soon turning away. It's a choice that was being made. And Paul says, it's been declared to me concerning you, and each of you is saying... Now, notice what's happening in verse 12. In verse 12, as you're reading through this text, you will notice that they are all saying something different. I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. They are all saying, well, who taught them to say something different? Did Paul tell them? No, they didn't learn that from Paul. Did Christ tell them? No, they didn't learn that from Christ. Denominationalism. Division in the church is devised by the human mind. Each of you is saying this. They were saying different things. They were wearing different names. Now you know who Paul is. You know who Apollos is. You know who Cephas or Peter is. You know who Christ is. And yet these individuals were claiming allegiance to one of these people and therefore they were wearing the name of one of these individuals. And Paul says that is not anywhere in line with what God says about His church. Why don't you just let this settle in for a minute. And notice how the emphasis is placed on what each of you is saying. And how they're not saying the same thing. We're going to talk more about that in this lesson. And they're wearing different names. And we'll talk more about that in a little while as well. As you look around at the denominational world today, where have they come from? And I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be judgmental, and certainly tonight when I'm talking about the denominational world, I'm not trying to talk down upon anyone. I'm trying to look at it in a very objective way. Where has denominationalism come from? Is it something that's been devised in the human mind? 
Have you seen, have you, have you observed any denominations that have started in the last, pick a number, 10 years, the last 20 years, the last 30 years? Where did they come from? Could it be possible to say that they were devised by a human mind that said, we want to start this kind of church? That's where denominationalism comes from, and that's what we learn from this text. Each of you is saying this. This is what you want in a church. Second thing we see in this text. Denominationalism is is not devised in God's mind because it was totally contrary to what Paul is talking about. The second thing we see about denominationalism is that denominationalism is division. And it's division that is not recognized by God. That does it strike you? Does it strike you when you're reading through this, in verse 10 especially, as you're reading through this, that God is pleading? God is pleading that there be no divisions among you. Anytime I have the opportunity to sit down and to study the Bible one-on-one with somebody, there's certain key passages that we're going to look at, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 is one of them. And usually I'll get to it in the first study that I have with somebody, but it, it, I'll get there in the first study, but I'll tell them, you know what, next time we get together, we're going to spend a little bit more time here. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, to me, is one of those verses that just jumps off the page. And that's what I'll tell somebody if I'm sitting in a study with them. It just jumps off the page at me. Because here is God saying, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be... How many divisions would be okay with God? Would, would Maybe just two. I mean, just two. Two is not that bad, right? Three? How many divisions would be permissible with God? Doesn't it just jump off the page to you when God's saying that there be... No divisions among you. Again, I want to be careful and keep keep things in a proper perspective here. Denominationalism, by definition, is division. Is taking that and and, and even if you look at look up a definition for denomin for denomination. Uh, you know, on your handy-dandy app. I know all of you have a dictionary app. That's your favorite app you use every day. But if you look it up on it, uh, there's going to be a definition there that says here is a particular religious group that has slight differences, one definition will say, slight differences in their beliefs from others in their same religious group. What does that indicate? They're not on the same page. They're divided even within their religious group. That's what denominations are, is there is division among them, according uh, just by definition, based upon their belief system. And what does God say? I don't want there to be any divisions among you. Depending on what source you use, most of you are probably going to be on a first-name basis with a guy named Google. And you're going to go and ask him certain questions during the day. And you might go and ask your friend Google, how many denominations are there? And you're going to get all sorts of websites that are going to have all sorts of answers. You're going to see some that are going to have it from perhaps around 300 up to some sites that are going to talk about there being 45,000 different denominations. If you dig into the bigger numbers, they really kind of boil down to the smaller numbers. But even the smaller numbers are around 300 denominations. And God says, I don't want there to be any divisions among you. Is God okay with division? Look down in verse 13. He says in verse verse 10 that there be no divisions among you. Well, what had they done when you get to verse 13? Is Christ divided? That's what they had done in verse 12. And he comes down in here and says, 
is Christ divided? There's some who would even suggest to you, and in, in, the, in the original Greek, they didn't have question marks, okay? They didn't have the punctuation there. There have been some who have even looked at that and have wondered, is it really a, a, in a question form, or could it be in a declarative statement? Christ is divided. What you have done here, is what he's saying to this church, what you've done here is you have divided Christ. But God said, want there to be any divisions among you. You see, the church of Christ that we read about in the Bible is not a denomination, number one, because it was not devised in a human mind. It was devised in the divine. Number two, the church of Christ that we read about in the Bible is not a denomination because it is not to have the division that we see prevalent among denominations today. It wasn't to have any divisions. It wasn't to divide Christ the way we see it happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Third thing on this, and then we're going to get to the second point tonight. But the third reason that we, that we know the church of Christ is not a denomination because of what we know about denominationalism, and, and I, want you to, I want you to let me unpack this point a little bit as we go through verse 10, Okay. But as you look in this passage, what we see about denominationalism is that there is a disregard for the will, for the authority, and for the words of Christ. You may look at that and you say, okay, I'm not really comfortable saying that at all. And I'm not sure that we can, that we can affirm that. Look, look with me in verse 10, okay? I, I just want to walk through verse 10 with you. Beginning of the verse, Paul says, Now I plead with you. Who's pleading? You could back up and say, well, it's Paul who's pleading. This is just kind of a personal issue with Paul, you know. He's kind of rubbed the wrong way because I like people and now they're messing up. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of him talking to them on a, on a one-on-one level. Well, that's not the case. If you fast forward into chapter 14 and verse 37... What he says to this same church when you get near the end of this book in chapter 14 and verse 37 is that if any of you consider yourselves a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. When you read Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, now I plead with you, it's not Paul's got got his feelings hurt and he's trying to straighten them out. His plea is a command based upon the will of God. When there is division that takes place in the church, it is a disregard for the will, for the commandments of God. I plead with you. Second thing, what does he say right after that? By the authority of Jesus Christ. You know, you you read that expression all throughout the New Testament. By the authority of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, you know, that, that when uh, Peter and John are put on trial, by what authority have you done these things? This man stands before, before you whole, they say in verse 10. How so? By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You read throughout the New Testament, you read that expression all over the place. Denominationalism doesn't have respect for the authority of Christ. That's the plea that's being made here. Colossians 3 and verse 17 says, Whatever you do, word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know Matthew 28 and verse 18, where Jesus says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. If Christ has all authority, if we've got to do everything by His authority, Whose authority is there that we can base anything else upon? Denominationalism does not have any authority from Christ to divide the way that they've done. Third thing we see in verse 10. is a disregard for the will, for the, plead, the pleading of God. It's a disregard for the authority of Christ because that's the plea that's being made here. There's a disregard for the words of Christ. What does he say? I plead with you that you all speak the same thing. We're going to come back and talk more about that in just a minute. But if Paul has to tell them, you all need to speak the same thing, 
what does that indicate that they were not doing? If you tell your kids, stop fighting with each other, what does that tell me that they were doing before you made that statement? I don't even have to be in the room. And I know that if you told your kids, stop fighting with each other, in, in most sane worlds and in most families, I, I know there's exceptions to that rule. But if you tell your kids, stop fighting, what does that imply? Oh, wait a minute. They were implying before that. If Paul tells them that you speak the same thing, what's going on? You, you don't even have to. You go two verses later into verse 12, and we're, here they are. They're not speaking the same thing. There was a lack of respect for the authority of Christ. The verses that are on screen from 1 Timothy, but Paul bookmarks the book of 1 Timothy, and, and he tells Timothy, I, 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 I've sent you to Ephesus, and the reason I wanted you in Ephesus is so that you could charge them not to preach any other doctrine. Don't accept any other doctrine than the doctrine of Christ. That's what Paul's plea is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. The plea that he's making here and, and you probably already have it written, but you might write next to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, because it is right in harmony. Jesus is just within hours of dying on the cross. And what's he praying about? It's fascinating to me in, in John chapter 17 that you have this long prayer of Jesus that he prays. Is, is that 26 verses? I've, for, I've forgotten how many verses are in John chapter 17. 25 or 26 verses as he prays this long prayer. What would be on your mind? 26 verses. What would be on your mind if you're just hours within death? What would you be talking to God about? It's interesting to me as you read through John chapter 17. 26 verse, 26 verse prayer. And he only spends the first five verses praying about him. He spends 21 verses praying about everybody else. I don't know about you, but my prayers are imbalanced on that, on that scale. I mean, here, here's Christ. And what's facing him is crucifixion on the cross. And he only prays five verses about him and 16 or 21 verses about everybody else. What's he concerned about? You get to the end of that prayer in 20, verse 20 and 21. That those who believe in the words that these, apostle preach, pre, these apostles preach that they may be one. One. Not, not two. Would, would, would a division of two be okay? Maybe a division of three. That's not a lot, right? That they may be one. Tell me what you mean by that, Jesus. Give me an illustration of the unity that you expect there to be within the church. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Is that unity? Is that oneness? That's the unity, that's the oneness that Christ wants in the church. And so when you fast forward all of those years, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that's what Paul is pleading for in this text. If you just limit yourself to these four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you will not find any biblical authority. You won't find any biblical approval for denominationalism. What you will find is that the church that we read about in the Bible is not a denomination for these reasons. Let's fast forward to point number two. The Church of Christ is not a denomination, not only because of what we learn about denominationalism from these four verses, but because of what we learn about Christ's church from these four verses. So you take what we just saw and now look at it from the vantage point of, all right, what do we learn about the church from these four verses? The word church starts with the letter C, so let's, let's start some, some thought concepts here, starting with the letter C. I'm going to give you four of them, and then the lesson's yours. The church that we read about in the Bible, the church of Christ, is the church that commenced by the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, I understand you understand that that church commenced, it was established, it began on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But it, was, it commenced by the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, what does verse 13 say? Where did the church come from? When, when Paul asked that rhetorical question in verse 13, was Paul crucified for you? Why does he ask that question? For a number of reasons. One reason is to point out the fact that it wasn't Paul who was crucified for you. It was Christ 
who was crucified for you. What's the big deal about that? It's not because of Paul bringing the church into existence. I mean, of, of, any, of anyone who could have brought a church into existence, if there's anyone who could have established a church on his own, oh man, the great Apostle Paul. But the great Apostle Paul did not establish the Apostle Paul's church. What he established was the church that was bought by the blood of Jesus. So when Paul says, was Paul crucified for you? Paul didn't purchase the church. Paul didn't lay down his life for the church, not the way Christ did. Not in that perfect, sinless sacrifice. And so it is Christ and His crucifixion that brought the church into existence. So what does Acts 20 and verse 28 say? When Paul is talking to those Ephesian elders there and he bids them to shepherd the flock of God, which is the church of, the, the, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Church belongs to Christ. He purchased it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And what did he do? He gave himself up for her in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. So the church that I read about in the Bible, the church that commenced by the crucifixion of Christ, started all the way back in the pages of this book. What if I find some church today that maybe started in more recent times, just just came into existence in, in in more recent years, Am I certain I have found the church that commenced by the blood of Jesus Christ? You know, if, if I read through the New Testament and I read about this church that Christ put on this earth, I need to understand that there's no other church like it. I know I've heard expressions sometimes people talk about, well, you know, that this church is sort of like, uh, I, I'm not looking for a church that's sort of like this book, are you? I, I, when, when, I, when I get home, when, when I get home back to Florida, I'm not going to look for a woman who's sort of like my wife and say, hey, I'm, look, honey, I'm home. I, I don't want a woman that's sort of like my wife. I want to go home to my wife, to my bride. And so I'm not looking for a church that's sort of like the one that we read about in this book. We ought to be looking for this church. I don't want, well, you know, yeah, well, here's this woman. She's five, one and a quarter. Well, my, my wife is five, one and a quarter. Here, here's this lady. She's mm, 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 so many years old. Well, my wife is so many years. And, you know, I, I don't want to get so, oh, well, that's close enough. No, sir, no, ma'am, not close enough. I want my bride. And when we're looking for the church, when we're looking for the bride of Christ that we read about in this book, we ought to look for exactly the church that we read about in this book. Sometimes, sometimes we, the, the church has tried to come up with some kind of an expression to indicate what our relationship, what the, what the church of Christ that you read about in the Bible, what the church of Christ's relationship is to denominationalism. And, and you've heard all sorts of different ones, I'm sure. Sometimes I've heard the Church of Christ being described as anti-denominationalism or being described as undenominational, denominational or sometimes it might, Church of Christ might be described as non-denominational. They, you know, they're trying to come up with a prefix before denominational to say, okay, you know, it's non-denominational, it's undenominational, all sorts of things. But if the church that you read about in this book commenced by the blood of Christ being shed on the cross, then the church that we read about in this book is pre-denominational. It existed before any denomination ever came along. And that's the church that Jesus died for. That's the church that Paul is pleading for in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's the church we ought to want to be a part of. Number two, the church that we read about in the Bible, the church of Christ, not only commenced by the blood of Jesus Christ and His crucifixion, 
And I want to take what we talked about in denominationalism and take this point. And, and again, I want, I want you to just let, let us walk through verse 10 here. But the church that we read about in the Bible conforms to the will, the authority, and the words of Christ. It's the way it was set up. When Paul says in verse 10, I plead with you. It's the will of Christ that he is pleading. It's the will of Christ that He is longing for man to follow. Is that what we're longing to do? Is that what we're longing to follow? You know Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him. He who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who do what? Diligently seek Him. The church that belongs to Jesus Christ diligently seeks Him. The will of Christ. And only that. That's the only thing that church can be pleased with. Is the will of Christ. And it not only seeks only. And notice the word only on on all of these points here. Notice the word only. Not only conforms only to His will. Not only seeks only His will. But it submits only to His authority. In Ephesians 5 and verse 23. Husbands. That. For some husbands, this is the only verse they know is in the Bible. It's underlined, highlighted, they got it starred, they've got it up on the refrigerator. They, they, They have a PowerPoint presentation they give to their wife every night. And so they know this verse. Husbands are the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. How many churches are there? Oh, there's just one. How many heads are there? Oh, there's just one. And so when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, I plead with you by the authority of Jesus Christ. Those aren't just throwaway words. By the name of Jesus Christ. That's not just throwaway terminology. This is the authority of Christ that everything we do is based upon. We must have the authority of Christ for everything that we say and everything that we do inside of His church. That's what we've got to do. We've got to submit only to His authority. The church that we read about in this book speaks only the words of Christ. I love 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. Peter says, if anyone speak, let him do what? Speak as the oracles of God. If anybody's going to open their mouth and say anything about what God says, they better speak the oracles of God. You know what the inverse of that is? You know what the implication of that is? If you can't speak the oracles of God, you better not speak. What does Paul say? Plead with your brethren by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. The church that we read about in the Bible conforms itself to the will, to the authority, to the words of Christ. The, word, the, the church that we read about in this, in, this, in this book, keep going in verse 10, sticks only to the mind and the decisions of Christ. That's what it's talking about at the end of the verse. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, wanting the same thing, and in the same judgment, doing the same thing. That's following after the will of Christ. Sticking only to what Christ would have us to do. Being of that one mind that Paul talks about so frequently in passages like Philippians 1 and verse 27. But you know, as, as, as I mentioned to you, I've sat down with a lot of people and studied with them and one of the texts we always look at is 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. But so often when we've looked at this verse and we've talked about the fact here's a verse that says God wants all of us to speak the same thing. Sometimes the question that comes back is how can we do that? Because they look around and they've been around and they say I, I, how can we all speak the same thing. We're not all speaking the same thing. How can we all speak the same thing? And the only way that we can all speak the same thing is for all of us to speak from the same book and to speak where the Bible speaks, to be silent where the Bible is silent, to call Bible things by Bible names, to do Bible things in Bible ways. That's not just some fancy slogan that sounds neat that's what matters and that's what Paul is pleading for in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
pleading for the church to make sure that they're following only the will and the authority and the law and the words of Christ. That's our responsibility is to get back into this book and to make sure it is the only thing that we are using, the only thing that we're following in all that we say, in all that we do, in all that we teach. We cannot afford to get away from that. But the only way that we can do that is to get ourselves out of the way. You know, one, one passage that one passage that it just it amazes me how many different ways people read it is in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. It is not a complicated verse in the Greek or the English. It is a pretty straightforward statement. When Jesus says in verse 15, go into all the world, we get that part, preach the gospel to every creature. We got, I mean, that's, that's easy to understand. He who believes, believes what? What I just told you to preach, the gospel. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus, what does a person need to do to be saved? I'll say it again. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But how many different ways are there that that verse is taught? Are we all speaking the same thing? That's not all speaking. When you are not teaching, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. When you're not teaching, you have to believe and you have to be baptized in order to be saved. When you're teaching something else, you're not teaching what Jesus is teaching. It's not a complicated verse. We, we, use, we use, we understand that phraseology, terminology, language all day long, and we don't argue it. I don't know about you, but when I was young, if my mom said to me, you know, on a Friday night, Friday night, you know, if mom says, okay, whoever eats all of their dinner and cleans their room can stay up late and watch a movie. Did you get the two conditions? Whoever eats all of their dinner and, what did I say, uh, cleans their room can stay up late and watch a movie. Mom, I don't really think that I need to clean my room in order to stay up late and watch a movie. That doesn't make any sense. I don't see the connection at all, but I'll, I'll eat my dinner, but, you know, and then I'll just get to stay up late and watch the movie. Would that fly? Not my mom. I don't know about your mom. That's not flying with my mom. Why? Because she just laid out the conditions. The conditions are very plain to see. And both conditions were made essential by her saying you got to do this and you have to do this in order to be able to do this. We understand that language all day long. The only way we can all speak the same thing is just to let the Bible teach and to not add anything to it not take away anything from it that, that we don't like. We're not to modify it to something that fits our theology and our ideas a little bit better. That's, that's, if I do that, that puts me in the place of God. And I'm not God. I, I, I've got to respect His Word and His authority for what it says. And, and I cannot accept anything else. I cannot accept anything short of what this book says. Remember what John said in that little book of 2 John, verse 9. Whoever transgresses goes too far, I think the New American Standard says. Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Anytime I read an expression like that, has not God, it makes me want to go back and say, hang on a second, who doesn't have God? Because I want to make sure I'm, in, I'm understanding this. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. But he who abides in the doctrine of Christ... He has both the Father and the Son. But if anyone comes to you, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him. Do not greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. I cannot afford in the presence of God today or in the presence of God on the day of judgment to accept anything short of what this book teaches. And what gets scary 
And that not only applies to me, that applies to the whole church. That applies to every congregation. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus wrote seven letters to seven different congregations of the Lord's church in Asia. Some of them were doing okay. Mm, Some of them were not. And when you read the letters, the first letter to Ephesus, the third letter to Pergamos, Jesus told both of those congregations, guys, you'd better repent from where you are. You'd better make some changes from where you are. Well, Jesus, it's not that big a deal. You know, we're okay. We're, we still got the name out on the front sign. It still says Church of Christ. What's the big deal? You know what he says in Revelation chapter 2. When he writes to, to the church at Ephesus in verse 5, writes to Pergamos in verse 16, he tells these churches, you better repent and come back, lest, verse 5, I come and take my candlestick away. You're no longer my church. Unless, verse 16, I come and fight against you with the sword out of my mouth. I don't think I want to have anything to do with that coming from Jesus. But what's his point? The point is that even if an entire congregation walks away from the Word of God, it doesn't matter what the sign out front says, you no longer are a church that belongs to Christ. Christ's church commenced by the crucifixion of Jesus. Who am I to change it? He shed his blood to purchase his precious bride. Who am I to think I know better? The church of Christ conforms only to the will and the authority and the words of Christ. Who am I to suggest that I have a better idea than he does? The church of Christ calls itself only by the name of Christ. What's interesting when you get to verses 10, the verses we're looking at, 10, 11, 12, and 13, what's interesting when you get to these verses is that there's been nine verses before it, right? It's not hard to figure out. We start on verse 10, you've got nine verses before it. You've got nine verses leading up to verse 10. In those nine verses, you read the name Christ nine times. So it's not like he's just dropping the name of Christ when you get to these verses we're looking at. He's already emphasized Christ nine times in the first nine verses. And so we get down to these verses, and while the Bible does not say, here is the name that the Lord's church is to wear, while the Bible doesn't say, here's the title that the church is to have, as a collective body, it gives us some pretty good clues. One of them in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. But really, we see it right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13. Remember, nine times in the first nine verses you read Christ. So when he gets down to verse 13 and he says, is Christ divided? He's not talking about the last of the four in verse 12. Remember Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ? He's not talking about the last one that was down there because they, 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 were, uh, uh, they, they were not right. They, they were uh, uh, perverting the, the following of Christ even themselves. He's talking about Christ. He's saying, are you seriously dividing Christ? What name should the church wear? Christ? We belong to Christ. Why is it that there is a sign out front that says Church of Christ? It's not not some title. Why is there a bulletin that says Church of Christ? Not some title that's there. It is a mark of ownership. It says this church doesn't belong to the preacher. This church doesn't belong to the elders. This church doesn't even belong to the bank. I don't know if you all have it paid off or not. It doesn't belong to the bank. It belongs to Jesus Christ. He's the one that matters in this church. Where's his name? But not just collectively, but individually. What name should I wear? What name should I wear as a follower of Christ? Why would I wear any other name? Why would I wear any other name than wear the name Christian? If anyone be persecuted, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, if anybody's persecuted because they wear The name of Christ? Let him glorify God in that name. I'm a Christian. I don't need to be a a hyphenated Christian. I don't need to be a a this Christian. The, The Bible doesn't indicate that. 
This is an interesting to you, only three times in the Bible you ever read the word Christian, the name Christian. Think about it. I get to wear the name of Jesus Christ. What other name could I possibly want to wear? Some other man's name? No. I want to wear the name of Christ. Some other group's name? No. Just the name of Christ. Because again, I am not trying to be unkind to anybody. I'm just trying to come back here. And Paul says, isn't Christ enough? Is Christ divided? Here's the last thing I want us to see tonight. Church of Christ is not a denomination. It's not a denomination because we, what, what we learn about denominationalism. It's not a denomination because of what we learn about Christ's church. Christ's church commenced by the crucifixion of Christ. It conforms only to His will. Christ's church calls itself by a name that says, associates it with Christ, says we belong to Christ. And the church that belongs to Christ clings to the one means of entrance that there is into Christ. There are all sorts of arguments that people have made to try to argue against the essentiality of baptism for salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13 is one of those verses that sneaks up on you if you're not looking, that sneaks up on you and when you actually read it and look at it, it affirms as strong as any other verse on baptism, it affirms the absolute essentiality of baptism for salvation. Look at what Paul says. As he's talking to these individuals who are, who are going away from where they need to be, and he's calling them back, is Christ divided? Here are these individuals who are saying, I am of Paul. And no doubt that just shook Paul to his core. How can you say you're of Paul? Don't say that. Okay, guys, if you're going to legitimately say, I am of Paul, two conditions. Two conditions. If you're going to say, I am of Paul, these two conditions have to be met. Number one, Paul had to have been crucified for you. Did that happen? Rhetorical question, was Paul crucified for you? And of course, I, I imagine being a first century Christian, they're reading, well, of course he wasn't crucified. Well, condition number one is not met. Well, what else would have to be true in order to say, I am of Paul? Paul says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, nope, wasn't baptized in the name of Paul either. So I can't say I'm of Paul and I can't say I'm of Apollos. I can't say I am of Cephas. But notice what this verse does. Sneaks up on you, doesn't it? Sneaks up on you to say, oh, if those are the two conditions that Paul says would be absolutely essential in order to legitimately say I am of Paul, then what two conditions would be necessary in order to say I am of Christ? Same two conditions conditions. Number one, Christ would have to be crucified for me. Did that happen? That happened. But there's a second condition that would have to be met in order to be able to say, I am of Christ. I would have to be baptized in the name of Christ. If I have not been baptized in the name of Christ in the way that the Bible teaches me to be baptized and for the reasons the Bible teaches me to be baptized, I cannot say then that I am of Christ. This text teaches us so much about the church, but it teaches us that the only way to legitimately be able to say I am of Christ is I've got to be baptized. I've got to be baptized into Christ. Christ. And when you take Mark 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You see conditions that are necessary in order to obtain salvation. When Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized by whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why would I do it? For the remission of my sins. You see conditions that are essential in order to have salvation. And the same thing here in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 13. Christ had to be crucified for me. And I had to be baptized in the name of Christ.
When you think about the church of Christ, don't think about that church that you drive by or this church that's on this side of town or that church that's on that side of town. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with the church of Christ. They did my mom wrong. They did my sister wrong. They did me wrong. I don't want to have anything to do with the church of Christ. When you think about the church of Christ, would you think about the book, the the church that we read about in this book? And would you ask yourself the question, is the church that I read about in this book, is it a denomination? And it's not because of what we learn about denominationalism and what we learn about Christ's church. Therefore, isn't that the church that I should be a part of today? If you're not a part of that church, if you're not a part of the church that you read about in this book, both in prophecy in Daniel 2 and verse 44 and promise in Matthew 16, 18 and 19, it says that church is going to be on this earth forever. It is here today on this earth. And you ought to scavenge through your New Testament and find every identifying mark of that church that belongs to Jesus. And you ought to search out and find that church today that is not looks like, you don't want to find one that's close to it, that is that church and say, that's the church I want to be a part of because that's the one that Jesus died for. How do you become a part of that church? You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You repent of your sins. Turn away from wrong in your life. You turn your life in the direction of Christ. You confess the faith that's in your heart and you are baptized into Christ so that at that moment, not before, at that moment, the blood of Jesus washes away every one of your sins. At that moment and not before, God adds you to His church, Acts 2 and verse 47. At that moment and not before, God registers your name in heaven, Hebrews 12 and verse 23. And now you're a part of the body of Christ, the one that he purchased with his blood. If you're not a part of his church, why don't you do that tonight? I love those first two songs, Wayne. I love the church. It's that church we read about in the Bible. Are you a part of that church? If you're not, why don't you make it right tonight as together we stand and sing?